Welcome to another Food Plotters Journal podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping landowners grow better food plots with less equipment, less work, and more success. My name is Randy Vanderveen of Strategic Habitat, and my co-host is John Comp of Northwoods Whitetails Food Plot Seed. In this episode, John and I talk about the impact this dry summer is having so far and what food plotters can do next month to avoid failure when planting their fall plots. We also talk about the issues with planting blends with several different seed types and sizes and how planting these separately will increase your overall tonnage of food. And we finish up with an update on the growth of RC Big Rock switchgrass for several landowners and what you can do now to prepare your ground for frost seeding switchgrass next spring. So grab a cold one and let's get right into the call with John. Hey, how you doing this morning, John? Great, Randy. How you doing this morning? Real good. Say, I was watching those uh, rain clouds go across Wisconsin yesterday, and unbelievable. It looks like you guys got missed again, huh? Yeah, yeah. That storm went almost from Duluth, Minnesota, down to down to La Crosse, uh, even even south of that. And the way the pattern moved, we I could see it from our house. And and uh, if you cross the river into Wisconsin, they got rain and we didn't get any here. Uh, it seems to be the pattern for the last three years. We get to July and, and the rain just shuts off. So you guys out there, girls out there that are in a drought situation, we're really no different here. So it's uh third year in a row. So wow. Pretty tough conditions with planting season right around the corner. Yeah. So um, how has that changed what you're doing for planting uh, food plots in these dry conditions like that? Well, what what we're doing this year, uh, we've got we've got some ground we have to manage this year um, north of us that's really sandy. What we're what we're doing is um, everything we're going to plant is going to be incorporated in the ground. Um, obviously, brassicas, you know, we're not we're not getting too deep into the ground, but we're not doing any no till this year. There's one plot that I have to do it. I have no choice. Honestly, I've not even gone and looked at it because the lack of rain. I know it's going to be like trying to the plant on on, on, on on a concrete parking lot because we've got a lot of clay here. We've got some sandy ground we're working with. We're just lightly disking the seed. Actually, we've got that four foot grain drill. Uh, we're going to be running that a lot this year um, where we can't penetrate the ground. We're going to do a, a one inch till with our tiller to court, you know, and, and plant that way. But, uh, you know, so many people I'm talking to right now, they're, they're wondering, they had buckwheat failures just because it's so dry and, and a lot of failures with guys that tried no-till with the seed on top of the ground. And I, I said, you know, gosh, if you can't get buckwheat to grow, you probably aren't going to get much of anything else to grow. I said, we all want to plant around a rain event, but in especially sandy ground right now, I would bet your, your moisture zone is three, four, five inches deep. And when you get that first rain, it's, it's, it's like a sponge that just sucks that water in and it's gone. Yeah. So I, definitely in these weather conditions and we learned this last year i'm not doing any kind of no-till even you know the buck we roll down i'm just not we're going to do everything where the seeds incorporated into the ground somehow whether it's a light disking it's a light you know people oh, you're destroying you're destroying your soil we're talking about a half inch deep. that's it but we're not destroying any soil by doing this i just don't think that you know, again, this is from personal observation on, on multiple plots last year with this particular weather pattern that we're in again. You're not going to have as good a success trying no-till without rain. No-till is a great, it's a great planning strategy. The buckwheat, whether you're, you're crushing buckwheat or you're crushing down our soil builder, that's a great planning method. But the thing is, you almost need, like if I can, if I can incorporate my seed in the ground, I, I, I can get by with one, maybe two rains, rain events. Um, cause it seems like the root system is going to start in the moisture zone. But if you're, if you're no tilling, especially on hard clay ground that hasn't been touched in months, that moisture zone can disappear fairly quickly. So yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. We, we've talked to folks from, you know, the Dakotas all, all the way out to New York and, and, and the folks that, that are, um, you know, experiencing this weather condition with very little to, to almost zero rain. We're, we're, highly recommending getting their seeds covered somehow you know not just with buckwheat or you know not just doing a throw and go highly recommending this year to try to like you know i I, one guy i told him you know grab some screws in the pallet set the screws at a half half inch deep you know scratch the ground put your seed down put the pallet over you know get it just get them covered somehow 
and that way there's a little bit of protection there, you know, as if they don't have any kind of patch layer, you know. That's what we're doing. Yeah, we have to do it this year. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, going with that uh, single species of buckwheat, um, you know, I think a lot of guys are, they're not just going to have enough biomass to, to cover their seeds. So, yeah, I totally agree. I, I mean, they're going to have to break up that ground just a little bit. And, you know, you don't have to go three, four inches. I mean, just an inch or two mm -hmm. is all you need. And uh, just to get that a little bit of dirt on top of the seed in these dry conditions, I think is the only yeah. way you're really going to be successful this fall. I Yeah, I, and it's four years ago, um, I remember going out to our food plots to get ready to start prepping for the fall, and we were standing in six inches of water, you know. And I, and I think back then with all that moisture, we had no-till would be, would, ab would absolutely, you know, it was a piece of cake. And there, are, and again, there's pockets of the country that are still getting ample rainfall where this will work. But, you know, one of the things that when people are talking about, and we, you know, we looked at, you know, we started this messing with this stuff six, seven years ago. But when one of the, the knocks on quote unquote tilling or, you know, tilling is that you're, you're, it's like a tornado going through a trailer park. And I fully agree with that. Like, like you know, you, you watch a farmer running a disc or a deep, you know, whatever implement he calls, they call it, that's ripping six, 10, 12 inches of ground. Absolutely. You're destroying that soil. Yeah. But what we're doing is a half inch to an inch deep. Like our tiller, when we go to till our red clover under for, for the brassica planting, it's set at one inch. That's it. I, I compare that to a strong windstorm coming through and knocking a few shingles off. Well, I, the house is still there. We can still live in it. We can still function. We put the shingles back on and, and, and we're, you know, we're back up and running. And that theory was proved this spring. I, I think once in my life I've dug earthworms in my food plot just to check, you know. <laughs> and that, well, I mean, that seems to be one of the big things is that, you know, an, an indication of a good food plot is you got earthlings in it. Well, to me, an indication of a good food plot is what I planted is growing in the deer eating it. That being said, <clears throat> I went to our food plot that we had tilled under the clover and oats for a fall forage mix. So I went in, maybe it was April, April or early May. And I, I think I sent you the picture. I dug down you know, a shovel full, that's well, how, how, how deep is a spade? Typical spade was six, seven inches. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was earthworms, night crawlers everywhere. And that was tilled with a tiller one inch deep fall before. Just once a year, right, John? It's once a year. It's, 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 a, it's a half inch to one inch deep. That's what we do. That was last year our, because we're in the weather pattern now that we were in last year, exact same weather pattern. Our plot, the only plot that made it and, and this goes back to the Paul Knox method that we've been doing and promoting and using. We've done this for so long. Those are the only successful food plots we had was that Paul Knox method where we killed under our red clover and our fertilizer, we put a brassicas down. We used some uh, plot doctor from Brad Harper. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, we put in our, um, you know, our fall forage next to that. Now, another thing, and, and I, I've, I've listened to Gabe Brown, David Brandt, for the, and I, these guys are great, and it and it it it. I think it's a good thing that folks are actually kind of reevaluating how they're planting. Okay, but one thing people all have we all have to under realize we don't have a half million dollars worth of equipment like they do. Okay, most guys four wheeler disc sprayer, and there's and there's ways to plant with that and and have a successful food plot. One of the things that's also that, that these, everyone says is you can't build organic matter and you can't build soil with tillage. And again, I agree with that. If you look at what a farmer's doing, he's taking a cornfield that he's taken most of the biomass and shoved it into a silo or a bunker silo where, you know, it's, it's not there anymore. And you're, you're, you're turning under eight to 10 inches of soil with minimal biomass, a bean field or a rye field. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have run this Paul Knox method, the three strip planting method with tillage every year, light tillage on the big field that you saw here. In five years, we went from 2.9% organic matter to 4.1. Wow. So every time we, yeah, we, every time we ran that tiller, but it was heavy rye, red clover, every time we ran that, that tiller, we were putting something back into the ground, albeit red clover, rye, you know, oats and crimson. That kind of stuff. I'm not a big fan of going out to a bare field and 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 letting it, you know letting the tiller just show up for the sake of tilling. I'm a, I'm a big fan of green manure plow downs. Something green, something needs to be incorporated back into the ground. So 
So I, I, I would firmly uh, agree with, with, pe- with, with people when they say you cannot build soil, you cannot build organic matter, tell them yes. If you watch what a farmer does, I, I 110% agree with that. But what we've done, and the soil tests prove it, and every soil test was taken on a four-acre farm within probably 30 yards of each other every year. I watched it go from 2.9 to 4.1%. Now, is that going to be typical for, for everyone? No, it probably is not. Is that the best case scenario? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I just know, you know, I'm a, like I've always said, Randy, I'm a fact-based person, and the fact of the matter is we did light tillage, we did the strip planting system, and we built organic matter. The soil tests don't lie. So that's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to continue to do and, and with this, this uh, drought weather, weather pattern. Uh, that's what we'll, do, what we'll be doing this year. Yeah. And so for guys that aren't familiar with the three strip system that you mentioned, basically you've got a like mm-hmm. a half in, a half acre food plot behind your house and you've got a strip in that food plot of clover, uh, perennial mm-hmm. clover, that's clover, you know, every year. And then you've got another portion of that plot that is in brassicas. And then the other portion is in grains. And then you just mm-hmm. rotate the brassica and the grain strip every year. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yep. and so you're, you're basically feeding deer 11 months out of the year, aren't you, John? That's kind of the idea behind this. But see, like the red clover, they pretty much left it alone. Uh, the red clover, yeah, you'll feed some deer with it. But what I'm doing is I'm growing, again, biomass to put in back into the ground, but also the, the amount of, and I'm really not quite sure, I mean, it depends on who you look, you're talking to, is that the, the amount of organic nitrogen that those red clover roots give off is pretty substantial. You know, I've, I've seen reports anywhere from, you know, 50 pounds an acre to up to 80 to 90 pounds an acre. Again, it depends on what study you look at. And I'm, I'm going to assume, Randy, that it's got everything to do with soil quality, nutrients in the ground, if you mow it or not. You know, there's a lot of factors that go in there. But if you could just say if you just got or 50 pounds of organic nitrogen from that clover, that's a pretty big deal. Mm-hmm. So, but the one thing I've noticed here, because everything is really drying up, you know, once, once, the fawn, the, the 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 fawning season comes on. We usually only get a couple of deer back in our backyard food plot until probably into August, early September, when we we really get our our fall our fall food plots are really starting to come on. We've got a we've got I think half a dozen out there every night, really pounding that red clover right now. So, you know, and I, I would imagine that uh, because it's one of the very few green food sources around here, I'm seeing just as many deer in our little half acre red clover plot as as the was it about an eight acre bean field about a half mile away? They're just not amounting amounting to anything right now. So, but yeah, it's it's a pretty good way to feed the deer, but it's just it's a really good way. And again, the soil tests prove it to build your soil. And I think even in January and February, you've got deer out on that little food plot digging through the snow to get to your grains, mm-hmm. like rye. And for for a lot of guys, I I just I just see a lot of. First time food plotters, you know, right away, they want to go with the, the meat and potatoes of brassicas, you know, and you know, a lot of times what you see is the, the food plots aren't big enough or they got a too high of a deer population or, you know, the soil mm-hmm. quality isn't there yet. It's too sandy or the pH isn't high enough yet. And trying to grow brassicas or soybeans or corn in a situation like that is just, you know, a recipe for failure. So, you know, my... I guess I would always uh, encourage guys, if you've got a new food plot this year, it's a first time food plot, and maybe the soil isn't where it needs to be yet. You know, I think you're just better off going with your, your grains, you know, and you've got a great uh, blend for that. You know, you've got what your oats, your rye, you've got buckwheat in there. Yeah, we've got three different green blends and a lot of it hints. Well, and, and we're, we're actually, you know, experiencing it this year for one of the properties we're working on is uh, we, we came out with that fall forage sandy soil blend that's got buckwheat in it. And just because I, I didn't think the peas really performed well, and I don't want to call it garbage soil because if, if you own land, you're, you're blessed and any soil you've got is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. So garbage soil is kind of a strong word, but you know, just the guys that, that just aren't fortunate to be, you know, living in uh, that Mississippi river Valley, just the, 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 the big egg areas with, with really good dirt. And we were working on this mix for a couple of years, and I think we hit it just right. But, yeah, I, I think, you know, we've had that conversation this week probably with, with 10 different people all over the country, and it's the same thing, sandy soil. 
a lot of new food plots where they had a forestry mm-hmm. mulcher come in or, or a bulldozer and stumps and stuff. And, and I'm, I'm really trying to talk people out of brassicas because, you know, with, without seeing a soil test, brassicas are, you know, they're a phenomenal drawer. You know, you know that as well as I do, but they're also kind of finicky to grow. And, um, you know, one of the things that re- that's kind of disappointing if you're growing brassicas, you know, you get to October 1st and you got, you got yellow and purple leaves and they're six inches tall. The deer aren't going to eat them. You know, the, the, the bulbs are the size of a golf ball. Well, there's not much you can do to recover that food plot. So we, we, I, I just tell the folks, you know, let's err on the side of caution and, and let, you know, we're going to hope, we're going to hope for the best, but ex- you know, expect the worst. So we, we try to always hinge on worst case, case scenario without seeing a soil test. And, you know, we highly recommend the greens. And I, what I, what I tell folks is that, that if you, you haven't done a soil test it's new, or you're, you're in an area with, with historically bad soil and you want to try brassicas, I would still do the grain mix, like our fall forage, 100 pounds an acre, and then maybe drop a couple of pounds of radishes, even if it's just off to the side within that, because the radishes have proven that they can grow in and amongst the fall forage if it's kept at a certain rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as the rest of the brass, because I just I've tried so many times, and I think this goes back to a discussion we we had before, you know, with these mixes where they have the brass because they have you know the whole kitchen sink in there. I don't think those are, are a very good idea. I don't think they, you know you can't plant them correctly. The the planting dates are so different from grains to brassicas to where, um, you know, we we don't do that, and I don't recommend that to people either. You know, so. Yeah, I, I think if it's a new plot or historically it's got rough soil conditions, I, you know, we really do a, a, a strong uh, planting of cereal grains. Yeah. Well, you probably remember those pictures I was uh, posting last year of a, uh, a landowner's uh, food plot where we had grains on the left side and we had brassicas on the right side. And, you know, the, the grain blend was just oats, rye, peas, crimson clover, and, uh, you know, a little bit of radish. And then on the brassica side, it was real brassica heavy, you know, and just mm-hmm. a few grains in there, no winter wheat or no winter rye in that blend. And uh, it was a big name blend, you know. So anyway, th- I took pictures almost every week and, you know, you could tell that the biomass was just <laughs> higher on the grain side. And then, you know, most of the deer, we, you know, every time we would drive by, it would, you'd see the deer mostly on the grain side. But the other thing too, John, is, um, you know, because that was sandy soil, that brassica blend was really not the the good choice you know for that side of the food plot it should have been you know the whole thing should have been grains but you know hey the landowner got a good deal on it and he wanted to try it and so hey let's let's do it it was a great opportunity for a test but you know now the other the other thing that uh if you take it all the way into now this year this spring boy you could tell that there was a lot more weeds on the brassica side just because it didn't have the biomass and the uh, weed suppressing abilities that the grains provided. And so, wow, the, the, the weed competition was really, really high on that brassica side. So, yeah, li- like you said, there's too many species of different seed sizes. You know, I mean, h- how deep you're going to, if you got a drill or something, or you're going to disc or till, how deep you're going to put the blend? You know, really, a lot of those multi-species, like 12 different mm-hmm. seeds in a blend, should be separated. You know, your big seeds and your small seeds and put them on at two different times. If a lot of guys would just uh, maybe take a year and, and maybe go with a grain blend first, uh, especially on new plots, see how it does, and then give yourself another year to amend the soil, and then maybe look at maybe put brassicas in the following year. Yeah, yeah, getting the soil correct for brassicas is it's it's pretty important, you know, to have a successful plot. I mean, if you think about what 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 is a successful plot, I think that if you know, given your area, you know, your little piece of heaven, what what is that going to allow you to grow? and grow successfully. What I mean successfully is if you're growing brassicas, you might have deer pressure, but if, if you can successfully grow brassicas, like with our mix, three to four foot tall leaves, softball to pineapple, I've already seen with some of the varieties of turnips just under the size of a, you know, a small volleyball, you can grow a lot of tonnage. That's because your soil is capable of producing that, that volume of food. Now, if you've got lesser soils and you can still produce a high volume of food, but it, it's going to be the cereal grains. That's that's fine because typically in those areas that that there's you know not the best soil, the the, the surrounding vegetation quickly dies in August. Everything turns brown, and, and those food plots, even if it's just rye, glow like stick out like a sore thumb, and the deer are pretty attracted to them quickly. 
Mm-hmm. Those multi-species mix, I mean, there just seems to be more and more, and I don't want to call them fads or, you know, it's just more and more and more things are being thrown at hunters and, and, and uh, folks that are looking to plant food plots. And these side-by-side food plots, planting methods, grain separate from brassicas, we've done this, Randy, for, gosh, I think, I think actually next month is our 10-year anniversary. You know, we, we sell food plot seed for a living. Now, that's how I make my living. And if I thought these multi-species blends was a great idea to get the optimum results in October, November, December to create the most amount of tonnage on these food plots, I would have done it a long time ago. I've just not seen anything remotely close comparing our strip system. You keep the brassica separate. You keep the cereal grains separate as far as tonnage. And, and the other thing that kind of confirms this is that you know, we work with guys like you. We work with multiple whitetail end managers, and there's not one of them, not one of them. And anybody listening to this podcast, there isn't a single whitetail end manager we work with that recommends any of these species, these multi-species mixes, not one. There's a reason for that. These guys have to be right every time. This is what they do for a living. And when, when the best whitetail end managers in the country do not recommend this, that should tell you something. Yeah. Well, and when you say multi-species, you know, you're not talking about, you know, four or five blends in the same family, like grains, you know, four or five different types of grains. Right. You know, we're talking brassicas and grains and clover. I mean, you got from the biggest seed down to the smallest seed, all mm-hmm. put in the same bag. It just doesn't work, you know, so. Can you Can you get something to grow? Absolutely. It will be green. Yes. And there's guys listening saying, oh, BS, John, I do this all the time. But great, that's you know, good for you. I'm happy for you. Here's the thing. To get the most tonnage out of a sweet peas brassica mix, you plant it six pounds an acre. If you want to add 50 to 100 pounds a piece to it, that's great. If the deer browsing starts, we'll drop some rye in there. We might add a little bit of crimson clover instead of the peas. But to throw it in with the fall forage and some sugar beets and maybe throw some Egyptian wheat in there and all that, you're just... The volume and the tonnage will not be there. I've run these tests every year on our food plots. We're going to do it again this year, and we're going to show folks this is, again, you can get green. You're not going to get the volume. You're not going to get the tonnage. And, again, the guys, the smartest guys, the guys that do this for a living, not one single one recommends these multi-species mixes, and that should tell people something. Yeah, absolutely. So, um what are you hearing on uh, reports from clients, John, who have uh, planted the RC Big Rock this year for the first time? Are you getting some uh, good feedback on that? Yes, they love it. They love it. I, I've got some planted here, and we, we've had a kind of a late, a late spring that went straight into a drought. So it's not performing as good as, as it should. It's not performing as good as the pictures I'm seeing. I've already seen folks with four-foot-tall switchgrass the first year with this RC Big Rock. I think that's a two-part pat on the back. One, it's a pat on the back to the landowners that got the planting right. They got the, you know, they got the the, the beds prepped. They've got the the planting areas prepped correctly, and then it's uh, it's a pat on the back to Roger and his, and his staff uh, at Reap Canada for producing. You know, without we always before we sell something, we like to see it, and and we obviously we couldn't see this and have it in our hands and plant it because it was it was new to the country, new to the Midwest or the whole, you know, U.S., but everything we've seen has been just better than expectations, and, and um, we actually just signed with, with Don and, and Roger for a substantial amount of um, RC Big Rock next year, RC Tecumseh, maybe a few more of their products, and, and again, we're going to be one of the few suppliers in the country that actually get to import this, and uh, so it's basically going from the farm to uh, our shelf and, uh, and and we're one of the few people that get to do that. We're pretty excited about that. But boy, oh boy, even even at the comps, I'm seeing you know the comps are two feet tall with, with customers, and, and and this is all over the country. And I I really think this RC line of switchgrass is going to be uh, a game changer uh, for habitat managers the next uh, you know years to come. Yeah. So do you have any uh, RC Big Rock left in stock, or is it pretty much all gone? No, we. We would get a pallet of it in, Randy, and it would be gone in about four days. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, that was pretty amazing, and I I think that's one of the reasons uh, why Roger's excited to uh, to have us uh, be one of the re- recipients of a substantial load next year is just because we've got we've got such a great customer base 
uh, an outreach in the whitetail industry um, in, in uh, folks know that this, uh, they can count us for, for probably some of the best switchgrass seed that they've ever seen. So yeah. we're pretty excited about it. But the, just the results, I mean, from Michigan, Illinois, uh, New York, um, it's just all over. We're seeing great, great results with it. And I know mine, mine here is about uh, maybe 18 inches tall. I thought I did a good job of killing weeds. I sprayed twice last year, but I got, uh, I got a little bit of broadleaf issue. So I don't know if we're going to mow it or just, uh, let it go and see how well it can do. You know, I'm not going to drop any chemicals on it the first year here, obviously, but, um, pretty pleased with it so far. Okay. So I think Roger, he's, um, he's going to make some changes over the, uh, well, I think he's already in motion, making changes to produce a, a lot more of it so that uh, you've got a lot more available next year. Yeah, they're increasing their growing acreage. I believe they're investing into some cleaning facilities, but they, they were shocked at the demand for the RSD products. And the one thing they weren't, <laughs> they weren't used to, and, and what is, does he call it? I think he calls it snow seeding. And and we call it frost seeding. And they were they were kind of shocked, and they weren't ready for that that massive demand January February. Um, <laughs> so that yeah, they they were kind of they 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 found that odd that that everybody does that. But I said, well, most people don't have big planting equipment, and and uh, you know you can pretty much you could do this with a backpack sprayer and a hand you know a little earthway bag seeder. And, and you know he thought that was pretty cool, but it was you know they weren't forecasting that. So they they understand that and, and and actually they're they're ramping up their cleaning facilities. So we'll probably have our first shipment of RC Big Rock sounds like November. Mm. So we're pretty excited about that. I I still think we need to talk to Rob. Hopefully maybe he's slowing down a little bit. We can get him on on one of these talks and 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 let him explain. It's very fascinating um, to talk to. Uh, when he talks about switchgrass and the, and there's some other native stuff they're working on. He kind of he discusses um, the scanthus a little bit and, and why they don't touch that stuff anymore. And just an interesting guy to talk to. I mean, uh, you know, his, his knowledge of switchgrass is, you know, tenfold more than anybody I've ever met in my life. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> so, so John talking about frost seed um, for guys that think they might want to frost seed next year, what would you recommend that they do this fall to prep for frost seeding in say March? That, yeah, that's actually a great question and perfect timing. So what we would do, um, we're, we're going to put switchgrass in in uh, March next year, or you can you can seed uh, October or November as long as you're not, you know, boogering up your deer hunting. I would say probably, you know, if it's a field right now, pasture or something like that, maybe get in there with the brush hog and or mower and start to mow that down. Well, what's very important is you don't have that big windrow clump of of batch that comes out the back of the brush hog or the mower you want it distributed nice and even because we don't want an inch layer of something here or there where the simazine can't penetrate or the roundup can't penetrate so mow it now and then let it start to regrowth and then especially in this hot summer uh if it's growing back you know really quickly then spray an application of 24d roundup and simazine the first time let's say late july and then in august you could probably do Depending on if it's all grasses or if there's still broadleaf growing, you could do another 240 and roundup, but roundup for sure. And then in September, another roundup. And then you can frost seed October, November. Once the soil temperature comes down, we're getting we're getting you know cold nights again because the the thing the last thing we want is the switch grass trying to germinate like in September, uh, because more than likely uh, the cold winters up here anywhere are going to kill it, while it's just you know a month or two old. And then you could also frost seed in March. You know, if it's a, if it's on a slope, we might want to wait till the snow is melted. But you can start prepping your switchgrass now. If you feel like you want to, you know, the ground's too bumpy or lumpy or whatever, and you want to till it and disc it and smooth it out, obviously you can do that now. And then just let it start to green up, and then try to do your three springs. You know, maybe like a month later. You know, because we we have to have. There's a few a few folks don't understand how Roundup works. It's a contact herbicide. It has to be applied on something green and growing. It's not a pre I'm sorry. It's not a pre-emergent that you can just put down on the ground, say like a simazine, and and then and, uh, and have a good kill. So, um, yep, that that's uh, that's a great question. Perfect timing, Randy, because we're going to start prepping for switchgrass probably in the next three weeks with our yep. first spring. Great, and um, you know one other thing I wanted to uh, just mention, John, is I've 
you know, running into quite a few landowners who have, you know, a pretty hard surface, you know, a lot of clay, a high magnesium count, which is, you know, part of that CEC number for soil test results. So, you know, a lot of guys are going, man, what can I do about this hard clay? I, you know, I got to till it all the time. And most guys, they don't, they don't have the ability to go till all the time because it's a matter of, you know, hauling equipment hundred miles to their property. So we had talked about that product that Brad has at Harper Growing Solutions, the, uh, the liquid Pinnacal. Uh, there's two words that uh, they, they shorten, penetration of calcium. And it, okay. it puts a lot of calcium into that uh, ground that's overloaded with magnesium and, and really turns that hard ground into kind of a loamy soil. And, uh, you know, even Jake's tried it. And he says, man, what a big difference. So, you know, a couple of applications of that a couple of years. And I think guys can really turn that hard concrete surface into a, a much more loamy type of surface. Yeah, for sure. I think we've got, we're going to try some of that here because we've got a lot of clay here. And, and this kind of goes back to the beginning of, of the podcast where we were, we were talking about, you know, incorporating seed into the ground. There are some parts of, of food plots that we're, we're planting this year that it is, it's just, it's rough. It's, it's hard, hard packed clay. It's like, when you throw a cake in the oven, you got to bake it at 45 minutes. You get that nice little crust on top. Well, if you leave it in there for two hours, it looks like a hockey puck. I think our soil is becoming the same way with, with this, this clay. It's, it's just rock hard. And you, you try to do the no-till system, and you put that, that little seed on top of that hard, hard clay. And I think Jake did do a test. Was it last year? You know, he, he no-tilled some beans and lightly tilled in with a disc he just ran his disc once or twice and then dropped corn and beans and he had the best the best results and, and it, he's got a youtube video about it but the best results were we where he lightly ran the disc and, and his reasoning was he had that hard clay and and so he felt he got the, the seeds into the ground and that he didn't have to deal with the clay with the seeds that were no-tilled had to deal with that hard clay that's all just something we've got to deal with, but yeah, that, that, that's a great product. If, if, uh, if it's going to do what it says, it does. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, John. Well, Hey, looks like we've got, uh, another system coming across, um, you Minnesota, the Dakotas and Minnesota, but, uh, I was looking at your forecast up there and it's like, you don't have any, you're going to miss out again. It's like, Oh man, <laughs> but, <laughs> this has got to change here yeah. quick. Cause, uh, we, we don't want to be looking at any conditions like 2012 with any EHD, you know, that's, that would not be good. Yeah. I, I have EHD unfortunately has started yet or not. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything on social media or anything like that yet, but I, and I don't think we get EHD this far North. I, I don't think I've ever heard of any reports this far North. Right. You know? But, but yeah, that man, you just, you just hope that doesn't, that doesn't show up again. And, and you know, that we somehow get the rains. I mean, I know we got to, we got a really hot week coming up, you know, starting around uh, the 18th of July. That looks like it's going to be a hot week all week. And then, you know, you just, you just, all you can do is hope and, and prepare for the worst. We've, we've uh, secured a, a semi load of rye. I, I think if this continues like last year, rye is going to be, unfortunately, probably in the same situation as buckwheat this year, where it's going to be in short supply and, and, and you know, unscrupulous people are going to start charging thirty to thirty-five dollars a bag, and uh, we're not going to take part in that. Just like we didn't do that with the buckwheat, but I could see that's a that's a possibility. You know, there's rumblings out there already of a rye being in high demand, and and one of the things I tell folks this year, it's it's kind of like anything with this country. Now that if if you think you're going to need it in the next two months, I would get it now. Yeah. If you think you're going to need rye, if, whether you buy it buy it from us or you know or locally. I would, I would get it soon. Yeah. I would, I, you know, like we're sitting, we're sitting really, our, our brassica supply is really, is really good. Um, our rye supply is really good, but that there's folks out, out East that can't get their hands on rye anymore. And you know, that's just unfortunate. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to be a situation like where it's going to run out. Uh, I don't think with us, it's not going to run out. I, I mean, but I, I do know there's places in the country already where uh, guys are saying they can't get a hold of it. Yeah. Who would have yeah. thought you couldn't get rye and couldn't get buckwheat in this country? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. It's like the staples yeah. of food plots right there. Pretty much number one and number two. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, John. Well, good. Uh, hey, a couple of weeks, I think you're going to be putting brassicas in the ground here. So uh, maybe we'll check in 
here in early August, see how things are, are doing. Hopefully you've gotten a lot of rain by then and things will be on the upswing, hopefully. Well, fingers are crossed, Randy, for not just us, for, but everybody that's in these weather patterns right now. It just, it just sucks to, to hear some of the sad news that we're getting from some of our customers with the dried up food plots. So just hopefully the rain, rains come back. We need them. Yep. You bet. All right, John, we'll check in with you uh, down the road a little bit. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Have a great day.